Okay, well, uh, I want to briefly discuss the um, mechanism of asymmetric cell division, uh, which are important for multicellular organisms. The cell must go into different directions, and there's all kinds of models. We know from model organisms that in most cases you can point to proteins that segregate asymmetrically, where one cell would inherit a protein or RNA. But what I'm interested in is the possibility that there's differences at the chromatin level uh, following replication, which also play a role in, in differences in cell fate. And this idea came up after we were investigating results that were supporting the immortal strand hypothesis. So Cairns had proposed in the 1970s that certain cells, stem cells, would be able to protect the genome from errors during replication by holding on to the template strands. So they would say any errors that follows replication would be segregated to the daughter cell. And I think there's, there's a lot of problems with this hypothesis, which I described in a paper in 2007. But I had to look at all the data uh, in the literature, and there are some examples where indeed it's difficult to ignore the possibility that indeed there is asymmetric segregation of sister chromatids. Most of these studies were done with BRDU incorporation, or tritium thymidine, so basically DNA is labeled one way or another, and then you look for the distribution of the label over the daughter cells. I think many of those studies you can dismiss because controls were not included or the possibilities that in fact you're not looking at daughter cells could not be excluded. I mean, maybe these cells just look like daughters, but one cell had not divided and another cell had come in. There's always a problem if you look at static tissues. But there were a number of observations which suggested that actually something like that is going on and that is still, uh, there's a still a lot of data uh, like that in the literature being published in, in good journals. So it's still possible. In fact, some people would argue and are alive at this point that the immortal strand hypothesis has a lot of experimental evidence. But anyway, when I was critiquing this here, I suggest, well, maybe it's not because some cells want to hold on to template strands because they want to avoid errors, but maybe there's some asymmetry at the level of chromatin. We know that if DNA is replicated, the two sister chromatids are identical, but can you really replicate the whole chromatin environment? And if you don't, maybe this could be some way of generating diversity between sister chromatids in terms of epigenetics, which could r result in changes in gene expression, which would allow cells maybe to adapt more easily to um, differences in the environment. So a kind of inbuilt m m regulator of diversity, if you want, at the level of chromatin replication. So I've become very interested in testing this hypothesis. So in 2010, we published that you can actually follow sister chromatid segregation by looking at DNA template strands. Initially, we, we, we published that you can do that using in situ hybridization, but in 2010, we published that you can actually also do this by sequencing DNA template strands. So now we have very accurate tool to follow sister chromatid segregation and test the silent sister hypothesis. It turns out that this technique, uh, which we call strand seek, has all kinds of ampli applications beyond testing the silent sister hypothesis. It turns out you can map sister chromatid exchange events at very high resolution. You can correct errors in the reference genome. You can do haplotyping because if you, whenever you see a chromosome which has Watson Crick, you know that uh, one strand must have come from one parent and one of the other. So you can look at all the genetic diversity and basically make a linkage map of SNPs uh, using this approach, you can map translocations. There's all kinds of applications of this technique that we antici didn't anticipate. And I think it will be very interesting to see whether indeed sister chromatid is random or if there's differences, it doesn't matter. There's other mechanisms to overcome differences or whether some of these differences are actually biologically important. And that's one, uh, one of our major research objectives in the next uh, few years. Okay, so, so now we have a new tool um, to look at strands in single cells, which I think has enormous potential for all kinds of questions and applications. So the challenge now is to, to, make, to analyze hundreds of cells quickly. And this becomes an engineering challenge where we need to go down in terms of volume. So all the, there's a lot of molecular biology steps which typically take place in microliters, but we need to go to nanoliters. So that, and how do you do that? So you, we need material um, sciences, scientists to help us figure out how to do this. We need uh, microfluidics. We need ways to miniaturize um, these kind of steps, uh, lab on a chip type of approaches to 
efficiently uh, do this. But I think if we can do that easily, say with 10,000 cells from a tumor, and compare it with 10,000 normal cells, we can get infinite inf more information than we do currently about the nature of the genomic rearrangement, the, the nature of the genomic instability in tumors, which I suspect will allow us to guide better therapies. So I'm very keen to support and see development of these kind of technologies where we focus on single cells and, and look at strands in single cells. So this will require, again, uh, multidisciplinary approaches, which uh, you know, will require a lot of people, not in the least bioinformaticians, because there's a lot of data that we generate now which, uh, which needs to be extracted and looked at in the most careful ways. And I'm sure we are throwing out a lot of data at this point, which, which can be used to um, extract important information about biology and about diseases. So uh, yeah, I'm very keen to pursue single cell sequencing, both in humans, but also in microorganisms. I think there's huge diagnostic potential. And I think this would be a very interesting area for Skultec, for example, to get into because it, it requires bioinformatics, bioinformatics, engineering, biology, and this is all coming together in the, in the creed that we just started here. So I think it's a very interesting time in biology where a lot of things are coming together. By, by sequencing, we can compare your DNA with my DNA and DNA from disease tissue with normal tissue. We can compare DNA in different organisms, understand more about the function of genes by manipulating genes in human cells, but also in mo model organisms. So this is actually a very exciting time for science in general to, uh, to be involved in. And now with the single cell dimension and the sequencing tools brought to these kind of questions, I think you know, the future is going to be very interesting.